morning crypto. Near this record high, if we go back and we look at past record high breaks, or if we eclipse the old all time high, three of the four times Bitcoin doubled in 18 days or less. And so if you think about that for a second, once you break through an all-time high, it's price discovery. What, what is this thing worth? The world is going to try to figure that out. And three of the last four times, in 18 days or less, it doubled in price. You add in the fact that we have the halving coming, and we're going to go from 900 Bitcoin a day coming into the supply to 450. And it's very hard to make an argument that Bitcoin is not going much higher and at a faster pace than we all expected. So as we near... Good morning, Warriors. Hello and welcome back to another episode of your favorite crypto news channel, Good Morning Crypto, where we bring you your, the most relevant and impactful crypto related topics from a top crypto research team in the world. And Mark, we're not going to waste any time this morning. We're going to get straight into our episode because we have so many exciting topics prepared. So first of all, I just wanted to start off by saying thank you for joining us this morning. And how are you feeling on this Wednesday? Uh, always great to be, always great to be with you. And uh Feeling good, feeling good. Although, um, you know, it is Wednesday, so I should be wearing pink, but it's cold in North Carolina. So I had to wear wear the hoodie. So I got I got the pink down low. I got the pink socks. Nice. So it's wear pink Wednesday for, for brain tumor awareness, um, but not to not to go down that path. But um feeling good. Life is good, you know, getting ready for spring break next week. Um and Look, the markets have been fun, volatile, but fun. Um, I actually have a T-shirt that I actually wore when I was up at Pomp's event last Friday up in New York. It says, embrace volatility. And, you know, most people fear volatility. Like, why? In fact, that's why the average person underperforms, because they're so afraid of volatility that they dumb down their portfolio. I shouldn't say dumb down. They 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 reduce the volatility in their portfolio and they go into cash and guaranteed investment contracts and and bonds. And look, I say this all the time. If you're young, and when, when I say young, I mean under 65. So I'm I'm still young, about to be 61. But if you're under 65, I believe it should be against the law to own cash and bonds and gigs in your 401k. Like literally, it should be against the law. But instead, that's what they they kind of scare people into doing that because it's really high fees. And so the insurance companies and the and the banks make a lot of money and the average person doesn't have enough to retire. Volatility is simply a disagreement about the future outcome of something. Right? That could be volatility in a relationship. It could be volatility in the price of an asset. It could be volatility in expectations for, for crops. So when people have a lot of agreement, like if I buy a treasury bill, we know with 99.99999% certainty, 31 days later, I'm going to get paid. If I buy Amazon stock, there's volatility, right? There's uncertainty about the future. And, and Bitcoin is is a great example of that and but the volatility is what drives the return because when people don't understand something or disagree about something if you do more work and get comfortable with the technology or the outcome then you get these types of of returns and this is what i think a lot of our listeners want to get your opinion on mark because people are discussing how this time is different because we have institutional demand before the halving. So I'd love to hear that narrative. And I saw you giggle. The reason you're probably laughing is because every bull cycle we hear, this time is different. But here's the reason that Four I believe- the most dangerous words in investing. This time is different. It's never different. So, but, but things change. Yeah, they do. But, but look, a couple things. One, humans are gonna human. So humans will always take things to extremes, both direction, positive and negative. Second thing is, are there new elements to every cycle? Of course, right? Here's the thing. The first cycle of Bitcoin, when we went from 0 0.003 cents, just think about that, to a dollar, that was a miracle, right? That was an absolute miracle because that was the science project phase. There was no assurance 
that when Satoshi unleashed this thing and Hal Finney tweeted out running Bitcoin, you know, God rest his soul, there was no assurance that anyone was going to plug their computer into the algorithm and mine this thing and that it would be successful. So that cycle is very different than the next cycle where we went, you know, probably from 100 up to 1,000 for the first time. And then we crashed all the way back to 186. And I love this chart. So if you look at that far left-hand side of the chart, okay, that's like a 40x move and then an 84% drop. It barely looks like anything because of what happened the next cycle where we had a 20x increase and then another 84% drop or 70, no, 77% drop. And what's crazy is this next cycle on the far right is going to make that middle hump look like the one on the left. It's literally going to crush it down because of simple math. We have a finite supply of an asset. And, and to your point, Abs, what changed? institutional demand change. Well, what do you mean institutional demand? We've been talking about the institutions are coming forever and they haven't shown up. Well, now they have. Well, well how have they shown up? Well, they've show, they shown up in the sense of a boomer rapper, right? And I am a boomer, so it's all my brethren and sistren who are saying, you know what? I don't want to buy a ledger. I don't want to download a Chrome extension. I don't want to type in a seed phrase. Just let me hit a button or actually I don't even want to hit a button. I just want to call my RIA. I want to call my financial advisor Yeah, on a phone with a cord. Oh my God, with a cord. Absolutely. I want to call my financial advisor and I want them to buy me some of this stuff. And I don't care what you charge me for it. I don't care how you hold it. Just don't bother me. And that's what happened. And look, we talked about this. We were together right when BlackRock announced. It was June of, of last year. And you know, BlackRock announced, it was June 15th, that they were going to do an ETF. I'm like, oh, it's over. It will be approved. And I was like, oh, how, what do you mean? How do you know? They would never, ever, ever have put their reputation out there without knowledge that they were going to get approved for sure. And, and look, I was wrong. I thought they'd be the only one. I thought they were going to game the system and make everybody else not get approved so they could gather all the assets. Now, they're still gathering more assets than anybody else. I think they've gathered two thirds of the total assets that have come into the ETFs. And Fidelity's done pretty well and Bitwise has done pretty well. And uh, one of the others has done pretty well. Oh, 21 shares. And, and look, I'm psyched because we own a little piece of 21 shares. We own a little piece of Bitwise. So I'm psyched for them. And Hunter and those guys are amazing at Bitwise. But BlackRock is the big dog. Why? Well, because the boomers love BlackRock. They love the institutional, you know, life that, that makes it easy for them for the financial advisor, wherever they are, except, except Vanguard, because Vanguard, look, Vanguard made a decision, which I think is interesting. Vanguard made a decision that they don't care about everybody listening to us right now, right? I'm, I'm going to assume that most of the people listening are millennials, Gen Z, you know, Gen Y. Um, they, Vanguard didn't give a crap about that because those people in their mind don't have any money. Now, some of them have lots of money, but, but on average, the money is held by the boomers. So the average boomer has more money than the average millennial. And that's not a bad thing. When the millennial gets older, time you know, will, will mean that they end up with more money. And the, the funny part of it, I think it's a bad decision because the boomers are now age 60 to 85. We're in the end game. So we're all going to die, die off at some point. And all that money that we own is going to our kids and our grandkids, right? So all that money is gonna flow down and it ain't staying at Vanguard. So Vanguard said, well, we wanna capture the bigger pot of money and we wanna be the one that the boomers that don't like this stuff can say, yeah, 
they they said this is speculative. No, fine. But I think that's a an infinitesimally small swath. And the rest are like, yep, 10 basis points, 25 basis points, 100 basis points. And let's do the math. This is why I'm, I'm so bullish on, on Bitcoin and, and, and the rest of the markets. There's 30 trillion, 30 trillion with a T. And remember, 1 trillion, we sit here together, 31,710 years, a dollar a second. That's a trillion. So 30 of those are owned by the boomers, controlled by financial advisors. 1% would be 300 billion. That's more money that's, than has ever been converted into Bitcoin, right? There's less than 300 billion that's actually gotten converted into Bitcoin in the past 15 years than will be converted. So we've had 15 so far into the ETFs on our way, I think, to 300. That 300 will then have a multiplier and people say, oh, the multiplier is 120. No, it's not. It was way back when. But the multiplier, I think, is somewhere 20 to 25, maybe, and falling. But let's say it's 20. 20 times 300 is 6 trillion, which coincidentally is the monetary value of gold, which means we'd reach gold equivalents because of this. And so I just made the case that it is different this time because now we have more demand, but it's not different because we're going to have the same reaction. Price is going to start to rise. Post having, it's going to rise asymptotically in the nine months following the having. Like I said up at Pomp's event on Friday, this Thanksgiving is going to be the greatest Thanksgiving of all time. <laughs> We're all going to be welcomed back. Everybody's going to be high five in. It's going to be, oh, we love you. Remember two years ago, he was like, you're not invited. You're disinvited. Scam artist. We were just yeah. scam artists. Mark, I did just want to make a quick point. Are we are getting a, a little bit of an echo. Is that just on my end? Or there we go. I believe I fixed it. Guys, we got over 1,144 live listeners joining us. Thank you for being here. Show us some love and smash that like button. And one of the things I wanted to point out for a lot of our listeners, Mark, is that the reason this is different is because the market is operating in a different manner. We're still in a speculative state, but we're starting to see real companies leverage this technology for real world use cases. And that's where I want to open this conversation up to maybe other blockchains. Solana would be a great place to start, right? One of the funniest things I like about Solana is that there was a rumor back in last October when Sam was, was going through his whole process and he was in jail. He was telling some of the prison guards if he was going to buy any token, it would be Solana. So the question that I have for you, and this is more of a lighthearted question, is what do you believe is driving Solana's utility right now? We've stated that it could be meme coins. It could be the DeFi ecosystem. If you're using Ethereum and you pay $100, they're going to take 30 out of your pocket to complete your transactions a lot of the time. You can do the same thing on Solana for under a dollar. Maybe people are just migrating into an e easier ecosystem, but I want to hear what it means to you. And what are some of your, not conspiracies, but theories here? No, no, no. Look, there, well, there, there are some good conspiracies, but remember, it's not a conspiracy if it's true, right? And so at the end of the day, if something's true, then it's no longer a conspiracy theory. So a couple things on Solana. Now, again, you and I have talked about this for a while. So a year, not quite a year ago, maybe nine months ago, I was on Altcoin, Altcoin Daily, you know, another show. And they asked me about Solana. I said, well, here's the problem. Solana has this problem that the network gets overloaded and it basically shuts down and transactions get vaporized. And oh my God, the Solana heads were like, no, we never rolled back the chain. I didn't say you rolled back the chain. I said that I can put a transaction out there. It bumps up against a closed network. It never settles. And if I don't know to resend it, then that transaction is gone. So they said, well, we fixed that. And there was this really nice guy from the Netherlands who got me on and, and we went through all this stuff. And I'm like, OK, interesting. And he got me to download the Phantom Wallet, although... <laughs> I lost my seed phrase because I'm an idiot. 
Um, so I don't, I don't have anything in there, but uh, he actually, you know, we set up this wallet. So I'm not going to set up a new wallet. Um, but, you know, and this is one of the reasons boomers don't do this stuff, right? Because I've been fine with my, because I have 20 seed phrases for 20 different wallets. And I have most of them in a nice lockbox and all this good stuff. But somehow I misplaced the phantom one, so it's gone. Um, but the reality is they told me it was fixed. Well, here's the thing. Okay. Then Sam started telling the prison guards to buy it. And then the trustee at FTX started making rumors that, you know, they were going to be selling theirs. And it's a pretty illiquid asset. I mean, it's not, it's not totally illiquid, but, but it, you know, so, so it starts to pump and people start using it, actual use for meme coins, for transferring USD. And look, transferring USDC on a phantom wallet, way better than any Ethereum experience. I mean, it's just not close. Instantaneous, like 0.001 cents. I mean, way better. And so, you know, that, that, that what I'm lost in my, my phantom wallet is $10, right? He sent me $10, showed me how it worked. It was un instantaneous. Now, you put meme coins on there and you got all these people creating all these meme tokens. And, and look, as money flows in, it looks like transactions are going, I mean, it looks like activity is going up. And so the price starts to pump. But here's the problem. A couple weekends ago, 80 that's a big number. 80% of transactions failed. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. You told me that was fixed. And so I'm, I'm struggling. Now, full disclosure, you know, we were early, early, early investors in Solana through Multicoin. And we sold, you know, two thirds of our bag, not at the top at 260, but, you know, between 260 and 130. But we kept a third. And when it was at eight, we were feeling pretty dumb. And, you know, now this back up close to 200, we're feeling smart again. Um, at some point, we'll, we'll probably sell the rest of it. But I, I want Solana to succeed because I want there to be these virtual machines out there that allow people to do other things besides save money. Bitcoin is the perfect savings technology. It's digital gold, digital property. And yes, do I believe you could, you could have a world of, and we've talked about this, right? Could there be a world where we don't have a bunch of L1s and bridges? And yes, shout out to the Chainlink lovers. Yes, Chainlink says they've solved it. So the bridges work and the Chainlink's going to be the most valuable asset in the world. Maybe. No one's convinced me yet, but I'm, I'm leaning, leaning their way. But now with all the development on Bitcoin L2s, I think there's 20 L2s superior to Lightning and 40 in development. Maybe we can have the Lord of the Rings, right? One chain to rule all chains. You guys know I'm a proof of work guy. I believe proof of work is what separates the men from the boys. That's a, I don't know, whatever the, whatever the politically correct men from the boys is. Guys, guys from the other guys, um, guys like Jersey, plural, uh, male and female. But I, that's a long winded way of saying, um, I, I do think there are other chains that have utility. Now the Bitcoin maxis are like, see, that's why we hate you because you like all the shit coins. Like, <laughs> look, I'm a technology maximalist. Yes. I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist. I'm not a, you know, Ethereum maximalist. I'm a technology maximalist. And blockchains are really, really important. Blockchains are the new computing platform. And if you haven't read the book, Read, Write, Own by Chris Dixon, everyone needs to read it. And he explains, and I've been talking about this actually for six years, I've been talking about this, that computing started in 1954 with the mainframe. Then it went to the microchip in 68. That went to the personal computer in 82. Then it went to the internet in 96. Then it went to the mobile net in 2010. And now we're going to the blockchain truth net 
as I call it, in 2024. And so blockchains, not AI, AI is a tool that uses compute, and you need a lot of compute and a lot of power, by the way, way more power than Bitcoin. No one talks about that. It's really weird. Um, so I do think that blockchains, plural, are important. Now, how it's all going to shake out and, you know, there are questions about XRP and look, XRP has gone a different direction, right? They've gone more like we're going to be the swift replacement and we're going to work with the banks. My issue there is I don't want the banks in charge. I don't want BIS in charge. I don't want the central banks in charge. I don't want central bank digital currencies. I want open public blockchains. I don't want private chains. I don't want private systems. I don't want to live in a surveillance world where I get paid. I get my CBDC on Friday. I have a couple cocktails. I drunk text about the president and my money doesn't work the next day. I don't want that world, right? I want a world where my money is mine. Like right now, we live in a world where our money isn't ours. Yeah. I just had this the other day. Sunday, I went actually to buy some Solana, believe it or not. I was going to buy some Solana, do some, some stuff. I actually was trying to get my, my phantom wallet back. But I needed some Solana. And I used MoonPay. And MoonPay uses your debit card. And my bank was like, fuck you. You can't buy that on Sunday. No. And in fact, we're not even sure you can buy it on Monday. Because, you know, we don't want you doing crypto. Like, I need to get another bank. But I, I, you know, remember, any money you put in the bank, it's no longer yours. It's theirs. And we've lived in that world for so long, we've become accustomed to it. But then I went into my Ethereum slash Bitcoin, and, and I've been playing a lot in the ordinal space lately. And... I took out my Xverse wallet and I made a bunch of transactions. I got some airdrops. I got, I got my rune stone. I'm pretty psyched about that. I'm pretty psyched about that community. Um, and it was Sunday, right? And I didn't have to wait for the banks to open. I didn't have to, you know, wait for approval. And that's better. It's just way better. Mark, I want to actually ask you about the expansion of what we're seeing right now with this blockchain technology. I'll just read this headline and we can open this up for a broader conversation. We got 1,564 live listeners here. Thank you to Mark for joining us this morning. Show us some love. Smash that like button. And Johnny Crypto, I'm going to kick it over to you as well. But we covered this all throughout that. I believe it was this week and last week. Coinbase is playing a, a pivotal role in blockchain's innovative tokenized fund, We've talk and I talked about the tokenization of everything for a very long time on our channel, and that's why some of these other blockchains are going to become more valuable. I think the tokenization yeah. of assets is the catalyst that changes crypto forever. When we see big companies tokenizing stocks, bonds, real estate, deeds, ownership rights, everything on top of blockchains, not only do I think that's inevitable, but I think that's only five to seven years away. I don't think it's very far, but I also don't think it's right around the corner. We've been covering an article about how AVAX and Chainlink, which is Avalanche Network and Chainlink, which is the Link Network, were collaborating on tokenized assets in Australia. We covered that on our show last week. And I think what gets me excited about that is we talk about Ethereum, Bitcoin, XRP, Solana, but there are other legitimate projects outside of the top 10, outside of the top 20. The question that I have for you kind of like more broadly is, is there any projects outside of the top, maybe five to 10 to 15 tokens we talk about every day? that you see as a legitimate project with real world use cases, maybe even have something in the works today. Is there anything that sticks out to you? Uh, so it's, it's, it's a great question. And, and look, in, in my job as a, as a venture capitalist, so 80% of what I invest in is equity in businesses trying to do just what you described. Right. So we invested in, you know, a company that then got acquired by Securitized that is doing a really interesting job. You know, they're the ones doing the the uh, tokenization of that that BlackRock fund. And so so mostly we traffic in equity. Up to 20 percent of what we do can be in tokens. To your point, we tend to traffic 
in the top, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Avalanche, Chainlink, you know, um, and, and, and we don't go very far down, but we have looked at a number of much smaller projects. And I'll give you an example. So if you go back to DeFi summer, uh, and this is one of my biggest misses, um, you know, we were in our fun too. And I have this guy who I absolutely love. In fact, you know, He's one of the reasons I wear hoodies so often is this guy, Matt Moravic. And Matt runs this firm called Permian out, used to be in San Francisco, now in, in Park City. And long story short, Matt served me up on a silver platter, compound, Ave, synthetics, all these great things that, that made DeFi summer so great. And I brought him to, to Pomp and Jason when we were uh, looking at our fun too. And we, we went through our Bitcoin maxi phase. They're like, no, if it's not Bitcoin, it's a shit coin. No, we're not doing any of this stuff. I'm like, well, Matt is actually a computer scientist and none of us are. And so he seems to think there's something here. Maybe we should look at this. We didn't. Huge miss. Parify did. You know, Santiago and... And uh, Ben did a great job buying all the stuff and, you know, going up 10x. So that was a big miss. So today there is one that we've looked at that I can talk about because I think we already bought it um, called Orca, right? It's a DEX. And, you know, one of the challenges I have with, with Uniswap is I love the functionality but the token doesn't really share in the revenues the way it should, in my mind, to be a, a true equity ownership or, or a form of a bond. And there's a new proposal to change the governance that would make it share more, which is why it went up 40% in one day. Thankfully, we owned it. Um, but Orca is a smaller cap, more integrated version of that. And that that's an example of something where we would go down to the venture capital layer and invest in the token. Um, you know, historically we did, we did something similar with one inch. It was like a DEX of DEXs. That one's been more, more muted. Um, but there are projects that we'll look at. Um, although, you know, Pantera, and a few others are more active in the token space. We tend to be more active in the equity space. Although uh, I've got some new friends that have been trying to, you know, turn me into more of a degen and 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 focus more on on tokens too. And that's kind of where I was going with this whole question. Is I watch a lot of interviews with Scott Melker, Raul Paul, Pompliano, yourself. All, um, who's the other main guy? Anthony Scaramucci is another guy I watch all the time. And what I think is inevitable, and maybe I'm making quite the leap here, maybe I'm making a huge assumption, is that they're going to move into other opportunities. Everyone's crypto journey kind of starts with Bitcoin, then Ethereum, then maybe a Solana or an XRP. But eventually, when you be, when you make some profit and you see the volatility, they go into these smaller projects. And that's what I was trying to highlight with that response there, is that I'm trying to figure out, is it inevitable that we're going to see the same thing that happened with Bitcoin happen with many of these other just legitimate projects. Maybe I'm not even talking about a Pepe or a Bonk or whatever meme coin is is trending on Twitter. Yeah, but those are different too. So, and, and I'm borrowing this from Pomp. So we have our Monday meetings every Monday and we were talking a couple weeks ago because Jason Williams, who's our third partner, you know, at Going Parabolic, I don't know if he was one of, I don't know if he's like the Mark Cuban of of Pepe, but he was early on in Pepe. I don't, again, you know, it's like Doge was formed, as I understand it, by Elon and Cuban, and then they sold their bags to everybody else. And you know, we'll see how that works out. I mean, everybody loves Doge. I, I don't. I've never gotten it until we had this conversation a couple weeks ago, and we're talking about it. And Jason's talking about how great Pepe's been, and Bonk, and Bobo, and and. Uh, 
you know, it was just, it was the weekend after the Geo Bowden thing. And, you know, now, so anyway, so Pomp said this line, which I'll, I'll steal. Um, he said, it's just monetizing attention. I was like, Ooh, okay. That, that's interesting. That's interesting because it's really not that different than penny stocks on the Toronto Stock Exchange or boiler room stocks in the 1920s or, you know, East Indian shares, East India Trading Company shares in, in the Netherlands, you know, 400 years ago. There's always going to be, again, humans are going to human. Humans have a desire to speculate, to gamble, perhaps. Um, and there's a very fine line between speculation and gambling. But um, so I do think that meme coins, while I didn't really get it, you know, GameStop's a great example, right? And, and the movie, Dumb Money. Oh, my God, such a good movie. Such a good movie. And it's a great date movie, too. I mean, my wife loved it just as much as I did. And what's amazing about that phenomenon is the power of the community to drive the price up, right? But here's the problem. If there's no underlying value, meaning literally it's just monetized attention, if there's no sharing of cash flows or equity being created, at some point, and you saw it at the end of dumb money, not everybody made money, right? There were a couple people who you loved in the movie and they were, and, and again, the ones they picked, the bulk of them actually did well and Roaring Kitty did well, but a few of them didn't make any money because they held all the way and then it went back down. And so, look, if, if Elon were to ever wake up one morning and say, you know, I hate Doge, that would be a bad day for a lot of people, right? Now, many of them would just be losing paper profits, right? They bought it here, it went up here, and it would just go back here, and maybe they don't lose that much real money. But if the attention shifts to something else, which is what, Pepe and Bobo and, and these other things are, are doing, you can, you can have a, a period of time where there's this FOMO effect, right? Humans are going to human. They're going to FOMO in. But if we're not actually creating something, like, like the Solana move, there's a little bit of FOMO. There's a little bit of illiquidity, but there's also real people doing real things using a wallet to send USDC cross-border payments. That is a superior form of sending money to the Philippines than using Western Union. Full stop. It's just Mark, better. Quick question, because you're talking about different use cases, right? And maybe I was a little bit, uh, we focused on meme coins for that portion of the question. What about other legitimate projects? And I put the biggest gainers on the screen. We got like HBAR, VChain, Gala is a legitimate gaming protocol. Cardano's got some smart contract networks. I understand that meme coins are coming into effect, but my focus is on some of these other legitimate projects as well. AVAX and Chainlink are two that we talk about all the time. These are tokens that, even though they're in the top 20, are a fraction of the market cap of something like Ethereum. Ethereum is about 400 billion. And Amen. I think some of these tokens it, yeah. scream opportunity, right? Amen. Look, Chainlink, and they, you know, the guys will love me now that I, I say something positive. Look, Chainlink has the potential right to be a world beater for sure and and look my big thing and again i'm not a computer scientist i invest in technology and i partner with great technologists but i am not a coder and so when i say that in in and you you've heard me talk about my my three mental models right the stack of protocols like the internet which is bitcoin filecoin Ethereum, and I'm not sure what's in the middle, the one chain to rule all chains, Bitcoin at the base, layer two, layer three, layer four, and then all these L1s with bridges. The problem is those bridges is where all the exploits happen. That's where all the stuff gets stolen. 
And I just heard about another one last night where someone was on a Discord server and they pinged the server and they sent a bad thing and he had connected his wallet and gone. And this is like somebody who's really good at, at this. And if they're vulnerable, <laughs> is my dad vulnerable? Oh yeah, so he's not, I'm not letting him touch that. So the, the reality is if Chainlink actually has the technology that makes that bridge impenetrable, I think how big could that be? It could be really, really big, but I, I can't validate that. So I need to talk to people and some of the guys in the community are trying to get me in touch with, I can't remember the founder's name, but, and I did that with Algo, right? I did that with um, Algorand because Mooch and Mooch and I are our buddies and you know, we're all the OMGs, right? We're all these old guys. So we're all, you know, late fifties, early sixties. And we all came at this from macro. So I call us the OMGs, the old macro guys. So there's Dan Moorhead and Novo and Mooch and me and Tapiero and Burbank and a whole bunch of ex macro guys who said, hey, this is the biggest macro trade we've ever seen. So Mooch loves Algorand. And I love the fact that Nobel winning scientists set it up and I'm like, okay, I'm going to look. But when I sat and talked to the team, I was like, I'm not compelled. I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to, to be compelled here, but I, I just, I just didn't get it. Now, if I have the same conversation with link and they show me that, yes, we can keep your capital safe. If you bridge from this L one to this L one. And, and is it interesting that I think it was fidelity. Somebody's used, I think it's fidelity is using link to, um, or maybe it was ARC, it doesn't really matter, is using LINK to use the proof of reserves for their ETFs. Yeah, that's interesting. It's a good use case. So each time a real life use case, and that's what I love about your, your graphic there. Look, meme coins, they're gonna, they're gonna moon, they're gonna crash, they're gonna moon, they're gonna crash. Knock yourself out, right? Gambling mostly, maybe a little speculation. There's no investing there. That's not investing. You want to invest, invest in things like Avalanche, John Wu, amazing CEO, Gun, great founder. You know, you want to invest in, in Ethereum. Great. Does Ethereum, look, one of the things is someone asked the question I thought was great. If Saul existed first, would anyone use ETH? No. Prob that's probably the answer, right? The, prob the answer probably is no, unless you say, yeah, but it doesn't scale. Whereas ETH has done an amazing job scaling. There's so many projects built on it. And yes, it's expensive. And yes, it's not quite as fast, but it doesn't break down. It doesn't cancel transactions. So I can, is... It's like the old thing when you're building a house, good, fast, and cheap, pick two. You can have it good and fast and it won't be cheap. You can have it good and cheap and it won't be fast. And you can have it cheap and fast and it won't be good. So it's the same thing in, in computing, but it's only two, safe and fast. You can have it be super fast, but it won't be very safe. Think about Visa. Visa is super fast, but every once in a while you got to get a new Visa number because it gets stolen, right? So Bitcoin, super slow, super safe, never been hacked, not once. This is crazy. 15 years worth over a trillion dollars. People try to hack it all the time. Not one hack, not one fraudulent transaction. Really? Come on. So if I have an asset, which I happen to have a couple in theory, valuable assets, according to the market, they're, they're valuable. And one of them happens to be my, my PFP. And I want that on the Bitcoin blockchain. I don't want it on Ethereum where it's a pointer to an AWS server, which could be shut down and taken away from me. So, you know, I'm in the on-chain monkey community. I put all my Genesis monkeys on Bitcoin and 
I love that. And I love ordinals. And now we're starting to see real building happening on this super secure chain. Now, does that mean that all these other chains are a waste of time? No. Are there different use cases for compute? Yes. How many different forms of computers do we have? Lots, right? We have personal computers. We have big giant, you know, supercomputers. We have GPUs and we have CPUs and we have VPUs and we have TPUs. All doing different things. It doesn't make them less good, but at some point, the blockchain computing platform is going to replace CPUs and GPUs and everything will be done on chain. And this is the point of, of Chris's book, right? We had offline pre-internet, then we had online internet and mobile net, and now we have on chain. And on chain is big. I mean, it's like monster big. And that's the part that most people, ask the average person in the street, they don't get it. Ask people listening to this show, they understand. Okay, good. But, you know, that's 1,500, 1,800 out of however many billion. And we need more. In fact, this is one of the things I love about the Ordinals community is they've got this ethos now of airdrops. Right? They're trying to get more people to open up a wallet, get something for free, and then become part of this community. It's kind of why I loved the Libra slash DM project at Facebook, which is why Ms. Warren shut that baby down. Right? There was no way that they were going to let that happen because if you airdrop a digital asset to 3 billion people, Who's in charge now? Great point. And let me ask you, let's, let's get into the topic of conversation. Our live chat is continuing to ask about this morning, but we got 2,205 live listeners here. Thank wow. you for joining us today. Once again, Mark, that's show us. Big, that's up. like the biggest audience I've ever been a part of on you guys. Show, so that's <laughs> yes, that is really awesome. We've Shout out to our Twitter listeners and our Spotify listeners. Those have grown tremendously, guys. So we appreciate every single one of you for joining our program. And the topic of conversation that we are going to get Mark's opinion on is the SEC's overreach and what's happening in the crypto industry more broadly. But the SEC is seeking a $1.9 billion fine in their final judgment against Ripple. And I don't know what you can or can't say. So here's what I will do, Mark. I'll provide a little bit of evidence about prior cases with the SEC and some of the fines that they've implemented because this one clearly stands alone. Back in 2017, a blockchain startup raised about $4 billion without a live product. The SEC took them to court and only fined them $24 million for their ICO. I found this other list of prior uh, fines that we've seen. JP Morgan, $300 million. Morgan Stanley, $275. RBS, $150. And the list goes on and on. Well, yesterday, the SEC was asking Ripple for a $2 billion fine with zero clients harmed. I'd just like to get some of your more thought, some of your thoughts more broadly. What sticks out to you about this whole ordeal? Well, first thing people have to understand, the SEC is funded by their fines. Okay, just let that hang there for a second. They don't get funding from the government. They have to create revenue through their fines. So, Right. They find ways to find people and that's how they, they stay in business, so to speak. And so what I what I find just crazy about this number is it's a political stunt. It's overreach of the most egregious form. But it's a calculated bet. And what I mean by that is it's kind of like the $4 billion fine for CZ. CZ did not harm anybody $4 billion. No way, no how. And, and arguably, the U.S. had very little jurisdiction. Now, yes, they did some stuff that was stupid in email, and, but, but they didn't do $4 billion worth of harm. Full stop. But they knew that CZ was probably worth a hundo. And so paying four, 
Eh. Think about Stevie Cohen, right? Who is in Dumb Money, brilliantly played. I mean, brilliantly played. It was so, so good. The guy who played Ken Griffin, Ken's mad at him, but it was pretty, pretty funny. Um, but Stevie was perfect. I mean, perfect. But Stevie paid two bills without admitting guilt. I love that part. No guilt, two billion. And I assume that'll be part of this settlement should should they settle. No guilt. We didn't do anything wrong, but but we're paying the fine. And for Steve Cohen, it was a, a calculated, you know, he said, well, how long do I have to stay out of the business? I think it was four years or something or three years. Now he's back in business, making tons and tons of money. And so those are calculated. And that's a extortion. That's extortion. That, that's what that is, right? If, if you tell someone, I'll let you keep doing what you do in a modified form, if you pay me, that's extortion. And, and I can give you lots of other examples of, of similar things. But the one that, that I, I compare this to is JP Morgan. You showed the $300 million fine, but two years ago, two and a half years ago, they were fined $960 million, just under the billion dollar threshold, because that would have been a bigger headline. $960 million for spoofing the gold markets. What does that mean? It means they naked short the futures to control the price of gold, right? So gold would be much higher today if it weren't for JP Morgan constantly putting downward pressure on it. And I loved the, the guy who was so honest. He said, well, look, yeah, we did it, but we don't have to admit guilt. We just pay this fine, no guilt. But here's the thing. We made 20 bill. So paying one, that's like 5%. It's a cost of doing business. And so if you're Brad and, and the rest of the, the Ripple crowd, and you're like, huh, I don't have to admit guilt. I got a big treasury. So if I can pay it out of the treasury and not out of my own pocket, and I don't know how, I don't know all the details of settlement, but, but the calculus that's going through their brains is at what level of extortion am I willing to allow in order to get to my, you know, end destination that I want to be at. And usually when it gets leaked to the press, it's kind of been agreed to. Now, there's also a little bit of sometimes where the SEC floats the trial balloon to try to end the negotiation um, by anchoring, right? If you put a two at number out there, it's probably not going to be a number that dissimilar from two or nothing. Um, so anyway, but I, I find the whole system abhorrent. I find it um, crazy. And, and what I really find crazy about this one in particular is, to your point, if you look at past precedent, much smaller numbers, just fact, no harm. And if, capital I, capital F, if there were clear rules that were violated, fine. But that is not the case. There were not clear rules. We're not even sure there was a violation even of the, you know, back end kind of changed rules. Even with that, we're not sure because they won't actually say this is a security or this isn't a security and these are the things you have to do. And then they flip flop. I mean, how many videos do we have to watch of GG saying Ethereum is, isn't, is, isn't, is, isn't? Come on, dude. It's, it's a one decision decision. Make a decision and stick with it. But don't do the situational, well, if I'm in front of Congress, I have to say one thing. And if I'm in the press, I have to say another. And if I'm trying to negotiate for, for extortion, I have to say another one. And people say, oh, you shouldn't say extortion about the guy who regulates you. Fine. I probably shouldn't. But anyway. With that being said, Mark. Uh, oh, go ahead, Johnny. Go ahead. You can clearly see the conflict of interest where they have to 
find people that make their own money. So why would they ever want any clarity in regulation? Doesn't help them if they're trying to sue people, right, Mark? That's the problem. Exactly right. This way that's that exactly right, Johnny. And and look, that is the insight that that's so critical here, right? If if you I, I describe this as there's a there's a uh, in in a relationship with your significant other, there's a thing called niggy sob. Okay. And what it stands for is now I got you, you son of a bitch. And what it means is your your significant other says to you, make me happy. Like, okay, take her out to dinner. That doesn't make me happy. Now I got you, you son of a bitch. Take her on a trip. That doesn't make me happy. Now I got you, son of a bitch. So saying make me happy is nebulous, right? If you said take me out to dinner, you know, buy me a nice car, whatever it is, okay, then I can comply. But if the rule is make us happy at the SEC, I don't know what that means. Impossible. I mean, don't do this, do do that. I mean, what does it mean? So I want to read this statement from Brad and then we'll just continue it with, cause I have my own theory here and I just wanted to get your opinion. The SEC is planning to ask the judge for a $2 billion fine in a case that involved no allegations, let alone findings of fraud or recklessness. There is absolutely no precedent for this. And we will continue to expose the SEC for what they are when we respond. And I believe the response is coming on April 22nd. Here's what I wanted to focus on, Mark, though. The more broader point I'm trying to make here, if we're looking at what's happening with Ripple, it's funny. This is our community and we care. If they bring this type of energy to other pro projects, whether it's Litecoin, Avalanche, Chainlink, whoever they decide to attack next, many other projects not only don't have the means to fight them in court, they definitely don't have the means to pay a multi-billion dollar fine. So my whole theory here is this. If you get a $2 billion fine, two things happen. One, that is 40% of all the money they made from fines last year in 2023 from a singular court case with Ripple. That means Gary can put that on his wall and say, look, I did amazing things for the industry. That's what I would consider a win. Number two, I think that they can use that precedent against other legitimate projects going forward. And that's where I really wanted to get your opinion on. Do you believe that's the case? Is Ripple sort of fighting for the industry when it comes to a fine like this? They may be able to pay for some sort of, I forget the word you used, extortion, but other companies definitely can't. That's going to affect this market. What are some of your thoughts? No, look, I, I, look, absolutely. You know, and it's a longer conversation, but the short, the short version of it is this technology is important. And this technology is, um, and it, it's, it's essential for the innovation of financial services. And, mm -hmm. you know, financial services have been running on the same business model for 838 years since the Medici's invented it. Okay. Back in Italy and which where I'm headed this summer back to see, you know, your, uh, your old homeland, but, and then for the last, uh, so you had, so you had the, 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 the banking industry, you know, for 838 years. And then you have this, this era of, uh, control that by the incumbents that is being disrupted by this new technology. And so the incumbents want to slow it down. Well, how do you slow it down? Well, you use regulation or the threat of regulation or the, as Johnny, you said, the mystery of not understanding what I should do or shouldn't do because I'm going to run afoul. And then to Ab's point, if now you strike fear into the hearts of all of these, you know, smaller projects, you pave the way for the people at the top of that pyramid, right? The all seeing eye to, to take even more control. And it's kind of like Sarbanes-Oxley or, you know, um, uh, the one after the gold financial crisis, there was another one, um, Dodd Frankenstein. So uh, you have these big regulatory things that come out. And Sarbanes-Oxley, what did it do? It basically 
increased the cost of being a public company to 2 million bucks. So you can't have small companies being public companies anymore. So now we have half as many public companies as we used to. And some of that's small companies not being able to be public. And some of it's big companies getting bought by private equity. We have half as many public companies as we used to. Well, what does that do? It concentrates the money in a very small number. It allows those to become the dominant players in index funds and people's portfolio. And in a way, they, they, they've memeized NVIDIA, Tesla, right? You can't justify the valuation based on their cash flows or their earnings. So it's just, hey, I have to own it either because it's mandated by the index or because everyone else is owning it. And if I don't, number go up, I miss out. It's a very dangerous place for us all to be. So I, I feel for the industry here, but I'm also hopeful that, you know, Gigi is not long for this world. I feel like there's going to be a shift in administration. Um, it was funny. Uh, Mooch was on stage on Friday. You know, he had his 11 days under Mr. Trump the first time and uh, President yeah. Trump, I guess I have to call him. Um, and he said, here's the problem. I know, you know, weekend at Joe Biden's is very unpalatable, but, you know, one flew over the cuckoo's, cuckoo's nest is, is unpalatable, too. So I don't know who to pick. Um, and and look, that, that is true. But I think the country is leaning definitively away from weekend at Joe Biden's. And, you know, who knows what can happen in an election. But Gary was appointed by that administration. My guess is he would not be reappointed in a new administration. My guess is we'd get a different form of uh, regulation. And look, if, if John Deaton, and I love John, and anyone who's listening to this, donate to John's campaign, you know, if you can, uh, get him elected, get rid of Ms. Warren, you know, Frizzy Lizzie, whatever. I mean, look, I, okay, do I think it crossed the line that they did the meme coin with the W word? Yeah, that, that was not appropriate. Um, but she needs to go and she needs to go now. And I mean, she's yeah. basically bought and paid for by the banks and she's not doing what's in the best interest of the industry, the technology or the country anymore or her constituents. So John needs to you know, clean her out. But um, so hopefully things like that will happen too. And then we'll get a better, a better underpinning for the future. Mark, here's where I would hey, like Mark. to take. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Johnny. Hey, Mark, I had this theory that when you look at what's happening, there's two factions in Congress and there's anti-crypto money and there's pro-crypto money. And you can kind of see that the two factions. In fact, they even got a list here of all the pro crypto guys. Go, go support those guys uh, for everybody out there. But my thinking is if Ms. Warren, if you want to call her that so kindly, I'll stick with your words, you know, ends up losing and, and she goes away and we all hope Dean can come in, that would be very good for Congress having someone pro crypto who can actually explain the technology to them would be great. But my feeling yep. is that if she's gone, it's just like, you know, cut the head of the snake off and then the next person comes up. I would imagine that anti-crypto money for sure. is going to go no, for sure. somebody else in her. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm no, wondering. Is. Sure. I don't Look. think. Yeah. Yeah, it's not just her. There's You're exactly right. you said. It's a hydra. There's the it's a hydra. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Look, we've talked about this before, right? The incumbents have a skim and what I mean by incumbents, I mean financial services globally, skim, extract, take $7 trillion a year from us, the little people who you know bank or transact or send money cross-border, $7 trillion. Most of that $7 trillion can be liberated by crypto, by blockchain. So 
those people are really unhappy because that seven trillion that we think of as expense is their revenue. So they don't want their revenue to go away. So they're going to fight and they're going to fight the way they know how. And I go back to the internet, right? The internet almost died in the mid nineties. You know, it was formed in 1991 and in the early nineties, mid mid nineties, it almost died. And Al Gore actually saved the internet. He didn't invent the internet, but he actually saved it because he cast the vote that decided not to pass a, a law that would have basically made what, you, what we're doing right now illegal. Voice over internet protocol was mm, going to be yeah. made illegal. Well, how is that going to happen? Well, AT&T and Verizon and you know, a bunch companies. of other people lobbied, which is just a fancy word for corruption. They paid senators and congressmen to write a bill to get voice over internet protocol made illegal, to basically make the internet illegal because they liked charging three, four, five dollars a minute for long distance. So it was split right along party lines and Al had the VP seat and he cast the vote, as I understand it, and it killed the bill. So we owe him a debt of gratitude, right? Because- Mark, sorry, I have a really quick question. One of the things that I don't fully understand, you might be able to help me out with this because I just don't understand how this works. If we were to see crypto regulation, and maybe you can clear the air here because I'm this question might be incorrectly phrased. But when I watch a lot of these bills passed and they pass like $1.2 trillion legislation, they co- squeeze some crypto stuff in there. Is that what we're going to call stablecoin regulation? And if so, what does that really mean? Because if it, if it means that we're going to have to deal with a lot of things we don't like to get something that's inevitable passed in this country, that seems like a huge... I'm not sure exactly what I'm trying to say. I'm being very no, careful. No, no, no. What you're trying to say is, look, The way regulation should work is we should have a series of bills that are specifically addressed to specific topics. If we're going to have a healthcare bill, let's have it be about healthcare. If we're going to have a technology bill, let's have it about technology. If we're going to have a digital bill, let's have it be about digital. Let's not have these omnibus giant, you know, bills where every piece of pork, which means every pet project of some senator, right? Let's send more money to Ukraine, which doesn't actually go to Ukraine. It actually comes back to U.S. companies located in the jurisdictions where the senators that voted for it. Oh, and they happen to have children that are on the board. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mitch McConnell even said it out loud before he got retired. And so here's the crazy thing about this is our current system totally broken in that regard, right? The fact that they just passed a $1.2 trillion spending bill in a mediocre economy is insane. It's insane, okay? Because all that means is we're going to have to continue to devalue the currency. Now, for us in crypto, particularly in Bitcoin, thumbs up, baby. Because remember, one Bitcoin is always one Bitcoin never changes. Just like an ounce of gold. One ounce of gold is one ounce of gold. Doesn't change. Only 21 million. And that Bitcoin isn't priced in Bitcoin. It's priced in dollars or yen or euros or Turkish lira. And those currencies are just going to keep going down, down, down. There was that cartoon the other day, you know, of the, you know, euro sub going down, the Japanese sub going down, the American sub going down and the Bitcoin rocket taking off. And, and that's, and again, it's not that Bitcoin's getting better. It's that the money's getting worse. And when you overspend, and I just did, I did a presentation on this a couple of months, uh, about a month ago in Cayman's called Power, Politics, and Populism. And I went through the history of empires. And this is not new, right? The Roman Empire fell for exactly the same reason that the American Empire is falling today. So as the Roman Empire grew, you took over more territory and you had these governors and those governors became part of Rome and they had their constituents. And so if one can, if one guy built a circus, right, a big stadium to have 
you know, stuff. Then someone else wanted to build a circus, but they didn't have enough money. So they took the denarius, which was a silver coin. They melted it down. They added some bronze or copper and made more coins. And they passed them out like they were real. But eventually the soldiers said, what the fuck? This isn't silver. This is bronze. I want more. So as their wages started to spike, just like wages in the United States right now, right? I, I just went through a cookout, right? The little, the, the hamburger joint down here in North Carolina, amazing burgers, $14 an hour, $14 an hour to be a cashier. I'm not saying it's not what they should get paid. I'm just saying that's a lot different than it was two years ago. So as wages start going, you know, parabolic, what happened is the soldiers stopped working. And when the soldiers stopped working, the Visigoths and the Huns came in, boom, end of Roman empire. So same thing happens when you devalue your currency. Well, why do you devalue your currency? Because you, you, you start with power. You're the most powerful nation and you accumulate stature. Then the politics happen. You go from democracy or republic to cronyism and you bring all your friends and you make them all the senators and congressmen and everybody's living a great life. And they're stealing from the masses and the masses don't really feel it. It's like boiling the frog and everybody's getting super rich, right? AOC, before she was picked like an actress on a stage casting call, right? She had a negative net worth. She had a negative net worth. Now she's worth 13, 14 million dollars on a hundred thousand dollar a year salary, 120, whatever salary is. It doesn't matter. She didn't make the money from her salary. She made it from corruption. So the, the system starts to go under because of politics. And then you have populism. So Napoleon, if you've seen the movie, right? Pretty smart, you know, powerful guy. Kicked out, right? Pitchforks, French Revolution, gone, right? American Revolution, we kicked out the, the European, I mean, the, uh, the British. So the revolutions happen and the people at the top eventually get kicked out. So what happened down in, in Argentina with Mile. So the Peronists are out. The Peronists have been stealing. Think about this. 120 years ago, Argentina was the third most valuable, or not valuable, most productive country in the world. Number three. Today, they're like a, a joke of an emerging market with 1,000% inflation because the Peronists got into power, became corrupt, and stole and then the, you know, populists said, nope, we want this guy. And he's going to abolish the central bank and he's going to get rid of people. And we'll see if he's good at it. So far, so good. But that's what's going to happen. And if Trump is that, which is kind of what he is, he's the populist choice, right? The average person, you know, you live in a city, in any state, in the city, the big city, it's going to be pretty blue. Not 100%, but it's going to be pretty blue. You go 10 miles outside the city. It ain't blue. It's red. And the further you get away, it gets dark red. Now, people show that map and say it's all red. No, no, land doesn't vote. People do. So it still is about the people. And the people split is still about 50-50. But the blue don't tend to vote as much, which is weird to me. The red vote a lot. And they, I think, are going to control this this November. So we'll see. And here's a couple of things. First of all, I want to make sure I have time for crypto ETS before you have to go, Mark. So just let me yeah. make sure I ask I that question. I got 11 question. minutes. I got 11 Perfect. minutes. Okay, so we have enough time to go into this. I feel like America, and this is important to get your perspective on, when we're talking about exactly what you broke down with these bills, the infinite spending, it's all fun and games until crap hits the fan. That's how I like to describe it. And as somebody who's in his 20s, right, and I, I feel like we always circulate to this same particular conversation, I can see the writing on the wall. Maybe it's seven years. Maybe it's a decade. Maybe I'm really lucky and it's 18 years away. America has decided that we're going to print into oblivion and there must be a restructuring that takes place. What people seem to be siding with is a global structure, right, kind of what we're, what we're indicating now. One world system, one world rules, equal opportunity, things of that nature, right? But there's this other side of the argument where people do want to be independent and people want to be able to climb the socioeconomic ladder 
to be an individual in a system, right? I don't want to yeah. be number 5,965,000. I want to be myself. Yeah. And, and that's kind of what I think makes this country so great. So when we talk about what we're seeing with young people right now, $14 an hour, it's interesting to you. It sounded like a lot to me. It sounded like a, a little bit. And I feel like that's because what I've grown up to when it comes to spending, I just went and bought three chicken breasts from the grocery store, Whole Foods. That is $17 right now, right? So that means I got to work over an hour to afford food for one day. Cause that's how much I eat in one day. And, and, and that is, that is the critical point, right? Is I was only talking about one side, right? That, you know, the minimum wage went parabolic, but the costs went more parabolic because of the de decimation of the currency. So I, I completely agree with you that our series of administrations, and it's really starting in 1971, since from mm -hmm. 1920s you know, to 1971, we were pretty consistent, right? There was no you know, stealing of the wealth to the top. Everyone was kind of getting rich together and the middle class was growing and there were rich people for sure. But since 1971, since 1971, the people at the bottom, very low trajectory, the people at the top and since 2020, right? Which again, we don't have to go fully down this rabbit hole, but 2020 was a scam to steal the greatest amount of wealth from your generation, abs, to my generation. Now, I didn't have any part of it, but the billionaire class took $4.7 trillion from the bottom. $4.7 trillion in less than two years. It's the greatest theft of wealth in the history of mankind. Now, part of that's the law of large numbers and figures lie and liars figure and all that stuff. But, but exactly to your point. And so I went to lunch down here at, at uh, Bricks, a little pizza place, and I had eight chicken wings and a glass of water. And it was $18 for me, just, just me, not, not three of us, right? Just, just me, lunch, $18. And, and to your point, so you got to work more than an hour at cookout to pay for lunch. It's insane. And it's, and look, the average person can't afford a house today, right? In, in my generation, when we came of age, right? In your late twenties, early thirties, home ownership, little white picket fence, little house. And my first house, it was terrible. I mean, it was a two bedroom. They counted the basement and the square footage, but it was a house and it was mine or ours. It was mine and my wife's. And then we had our first kids there and it was awesome. And then I tore the roof off and I literally built a second story and, and it was awesome, but it was the American dream. And, and then I sold it and I rolled that money into another house and it got bigger. And now, you know, now Zillow tells me my house here in Chapel Hill went up 50% in the last two years. It's bullshit. My house did not grow. It did not get bigger. It did not get more um, productive. It actually wore out and I had to put money into it. So it actually should have gone down in value. The money got worse and the money's getting worse so much faster because of this kleptocracy that we live in. And this is why I love crypto and particularly Bitcoin, but, but other crypto as well. This is the greatest re-seizure of wealth that we've ever seen, right? The boomers priced out young people out of the American dream owning houses and a 401k. Okay. So what do they do? They invented, somebody invented this technology, which now the boomers are buying with the ETFs. Okay. And increasing the bags of the early adopters, the young people. That's kind of awesome. It's kind of awesome. Johnny, what really, like and we got to have time for the ETF. So I got to squeeze this last Go question ahead. in, but Mark, I, I think you're right. And I think that's why I naturally found myself in crypto back during 2020. I was a junior in college at the time and I never went back. Right. So I still got two semesters left because I didn't go back to school and I, I didn't plan right. on going back to school when they sent us home. And here was the breaking point for me. I realized, and I was, I guess I was somewhat asleep up until the C19 crisis. 
I didn't realize they were going to charge me the exact same price to take classes from my home on a laptop. And I said, how, if I can't think for myself at all, that would be the only reason I would do this. Right. And I only had a year left. So people who yep. still are just participating in this outdated system, they have to use assets that will double in two years, like you talked about for your house. But who does that favor? It favors the wealthy. And that's where I, where I really just want to end this conversation. It's not poor nations that collapse. It's poor nations with a great wealth divide. When 5% of the population controls everything and 95% is poor, that's when nations collapse, not when 100% are poor, right? At least for no, my- that's why, that's why we talk about UBI. It's why we talk about student loan forgiveness. Those are dictators buying votes. That's what the Argentinians did. That's what the Venezuelans did. That's what the Zimbabweans did. That is what banana republics do. That's not what the superpowers do. The superpowers use their power and might to be global and create opportunity for all their citizens to rise. We're not that. We're taking the dictator playbook 101. We're following the Bolshevik revolution playbook. You can go back to the Bolsheviks in 1910 and look at the 10 tenets of Marxist. Seven of them are the Democratic Party platform. It's like, your mind just blows. And you go back, this is crazy. And, and I got in trouble, so I probably shouldn't say this, but somebody didn't like that I talked about this. Um, but I'll talk about it anyway. So there's a speech that Putin delivered uh, a couple months ago, and it's in Russian. So I am relying on the interpreter, but I assumed if the interpreter was lying, then someone would have corrected them on, online. But, but I'm relying on the interpreter. And basically what Putin says is, I don't understand why all you people in the West are confused about this assault on family values, the assault on gender, the assault on identity. This is the Bolshevik playbook in 1910. Go back and look at history. Okay. Go back and look at the, this one. This one's crazy. And again, I, people say, oh, you're a racist. No, I'm just telling you a fact. Today, pull up ads for any major product. About 40% of the ads you'll see are a black male and a white female. Just Mark, I'm laughing because go back to 1910. No, abs, go back to 1910 and look at the ads. Black male, white female. Like, whoa, 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 wait a second. What what is that message? What is that trying? And again, that is I don't care who marries who. I don't. Male, female, I, I don't care. Black, white, brown, I don't care. But that is a propagandist agenda, right? To attack, because if you attack family values, if you attack the things that we all care about and we hold dear, right? That you protect your family, you protect your friends, that we're in this together. If you divide and conquer and you make kids confused, right? I, I, don't, I don't know. That's weird. And again, it happened before. And here, I'll leave you with this last thing. Look at the back of every coin in every country around the world. On the front, I mean the front and the back, on the front is the bust of a king, a queen, a dictator, whatever. And on the back is an eagle. You go back mm. to the Greeks, the Greeks on the front, emperor, on the back, owl, start as an owl. Then the Romans turned it to eagle. Eagle. In 1400. I'm sorry, no, no, I'm sorry, 400, in 400. 400 AD, okay? Which now so you can't call it AD anymore. It's like, cause that's the saying you're, you're Christian. So whatever, whatever the time is. I'm Christian, AD. I, I, I call it AD, but there's some new thing like BCE <laughs> yeah. and D, I don't, I don't know, anyway. But the point is, the coins still have the eagle. I went to Portugal this summer, and there's a building from 1200, and in stone, white stones with black stones, there's a Nazi eagle. Like the Nazis didn't come along until that same eagle has been part of this dominant strain of people who've controlled most parts of the world for thousands of years. And so there's all of this that's interconnected. But at the end of the day, 
if we help each other in a republic form, you know, democracy is, is a form of republic, but in a republic form, meaning that each of us has rights, inalienable rights, and we should respect and do unto others and, you know, all the stuff that whether, what, to, to, doesn't matter what religion you believe, do unto others, love your neighbors yourself. Those are pretty much universal. So if we all followed that and we didn't try to, you know, question things like that person looks like a man, that person looks like a woman to me. I, I, I don't know. That's just how biology works. So when, when we get into all this stuff, it's like, whoa, 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 wait a second. So I don't, I didn't mean to go down a, a strange path, but at the end of the day, where we are is technologically driven. The problem is that technology threatens certain people in power industries. And that happens to be this time, right? The internet threatened media and commerce. So who fought the internet? Media companies, mom and pop stores, et cetera. And they all eventually succumbed and the internet rules. This challenges who's ever at threat. And financial services is the biggest industry in the world, bar none. There's nothing close. And so it's going to be a fight. And I've talked about this. 2009 to 15, first they ignore you. Bunch of nerds and geeks playing through magic internet money. 16 to 21, then they laugh at you. Ha! Nerds, geeks, magic internet money, whatever. 22 to 27, then they fight you. The only way we win is to stay together, stay connected as a community, like what you guys do every morning. And that's the key. And that's the part I love. That's why I do this kind of stuff. And and uh, cheers to have me on this morning. Thank you so much, Mark. I had to ask this question. This is a question from the fans. Will we see other crypto ETFs approved in 2024? If that's what the people are wondering. What's your opinion? No. No is the answer, no. guys. And Johnny, no. floor is yours for some final comments, and we'll let Mark go. If Mark has time, I just wanted to ask, Mark, are you invested in any Bitcoin miners? Anything there? Do you see any value in the miners like Mara, Riot, um, or so, so we, we don't own any of the miners. Uh, I love mining as a business. The valuation of the stocks other than core. Core Scientific is probably the cheapest because it's the most misunderstood because they just came out of bankruptcy. So, But generally speaking, I love mining as a business. I just think the valuations got too high because they they rallied a lot. But that doesn't mean I wouldn't own them for the long term, particularly if you already own for them. For the long term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank awesome. you so much. Mark, we love you. We, we got 2,792 right, live listeners joining us. Thank you for being here, everybody. Show us some love. Smash that like button. A special thank you to our friend Mark Yasko. Mark. We always enjoy when we get to do this. So thank you so much. It's a learning experience. I want to say thank you to Johnny Crypto as well. We love you guys. We'll see you in 23 hours. And like we always say, warriors.